So um, Arnie, I'm thrilled to be able to talk on this symposium um, celebrating your 80th. You know, unlike Rudy, I've only known you for 40 years. And so as a relative newcomer, though, I want to um, show folks the first thing that we did together. Um, this is a paper that was published in 1980. Um, early viral proteins in HeLa cells infected with adenovirus type 5 host range mutants. So it happened that um, my lab had made these deletion and substitution mutants in adenovirus, and Jim Williams' lab had made point mutations um, in adenovirus, and we had been able to map all of them onto this really cool map of messenger RNAs um, that Phil Sharp's lab generated. Um, but what we didn't know um, was how to relate these to specific proteins. And of course, Arnie, um, and um, very specifically Susan Ross in Arnie's lab, had developed a whole series of antibodies um, to um, adenovirus proteins. And so we did together, and we got together, and a bunch of Western blots later, look at that beautiful Western blot. Susan, Susan are you here? Is Susan here? Okay, well, Susan um, obviously was great at Western blotting, and um, um, with working together, we were able then to identify which of the proteins that Arnie's antibodies recognized um, corresponded to which messenger RNAs and which mutations um, in the map. So um, we thought that was a pretty cool piece of work at the time. And um, Arnie, I've, I've learned an awful lot about you since um, we did this work together. I probably never would have started doing this with you if I had known about what Rudy said about how your lab was. Um, at, at the time, um, but um, one thing that I learned as we were doing this um, was that when Arnie said he would do something, wow, it was done, and it was done quickly and very efficiently. Um, when Arnie said that they would do the Western blots, the Western blots were done and available very quickly. When Arnie said he would write this and that part of the paper, it was written and done, and um, that's, that's one of the things that I've always found um, great about you as a, as a colleague, Arnie. You always do exactly what you say you're going to do, and you do it very quickly. Um, so I, I'm fortunate. I get to talk um, some more about Arnie this evening, and so um, that's all I'm going to say um, at, at this point. Um, but what I would like to do um, is introduce the virus that I work on to you, and then introduce a piece of work that um, we just published um, earlier this year, and it's a piece of work that um, Arnie said at one point, hey Tom, um, I think um, you and Ben and some other folks should get together. Um, ben Greenbaum, um, who, who is the senior author on the paper I'm going to talk about, you guys should get together because I think just maybe um, viruses do something that we've seen happening um, in, in tumor cells. And so I'll tell you about that, but let me first um, tell you a bit about um, cytomegalovirus so that you have some background. So it's a beta herpes virus. You know there's alpha, beta, and gamma herpes viruses, and so it's the paradigm beta herpes virus. Um, it is the herpes virus um, with the largest genome. Um, it encodes something on the order of 200 open reading frames and 28 microRNAs. Um, this virus is ubiquitous. I like to joke and tell people um, that cytomegalovirus is the herpes virus um, that nobody's ever heard of, but almost everybody's infected with. And if you look, you find that, uh, that um, something on the order of 1% of newborns have evidence of infection, 10% um, of infants at six months of life, and then depending on how you look for evidence of an infection and where you look, where in the world, Anywhere from 60 to 99% of adults um, have evidence of infection. So what happens when you first meet up with the virus? Um, well, if you're a healthy individual, um, the infection is asymptomatic. Um, you very likely never even knew when you met up with the virus. And when you um, are infected, the virus goes through three phases. Um, the first is an acute phase that lasts for weeks. And during this period of time, many cell types and organs are infected, and you can find um, virus particles um, in the blood. Um, and then after several weeks, the acute phase is resolved, um, but then the virus enters into a persistent phase that can last for years. 
And during this persistence period, um, the virus replicates um, at a low level in epithelial cells in your salivary glands, mammary glands, and kidneys. And so you have virus then um, in saliva, breast milk, and urine. And that's telling you how the virus makes its way so effectively um, in the world. Um, and then sometime during the acute phase or the persistent phase, probably very early in the acute phase, the virus enters into a latent phase. Um, this is a phase of infection that lasts a lifetime. There ain't no cure for herpes virus infections. Um, and cytomegalovirus finds its way to CD34 positive bone marrow cells um, where it substantially shuts itself down. And of course, the problem is that it can reemerge, reactivate at some point in the future um, when you're less able to control the infection. So those are the three phases that the virus goes through. And um, then um, that's what you see in healthy folks. Um, who is at risk for cytomegalovirus infections? Well, unborn children, congenital infections um, can be a real problem. In fact, cytomegalovirus is the leading known infectious disease cause of birth defects. Uh, most commonly, it causes hearing loss, um, but it can go from there to, to quite profound CNS damage. And so it's a big problem with birth defects. It's also a problem with people who become immunosuppressed later in life. And so before we had um, our great drugs to treat um, HIV infections as the AIDS syndrome would progress, um, then cytomegalovirus would reactivate or a primary infection would become a real problem. And CMV pneumonia back um, in the 1980s um, was the immediate cause of death of, of about 25% of the folks who had AIDS. Um, it also continues to be a problem in the transplant arena, but fortunately, um, docs have learned to um, use the drugs that are available and manage cytomegalovirus quite effectively, so it's much less of a problem than it used to be. What about prevention and therapy? Well, we ain't got a vaccine. Um, fortunately, uh, Merck is in phase two, and we're very hopeful that that's going to give us a vaccine, but we still don't understand the immunological correlates of protection, what's going to protect the unborn child from infections. And so it's, it's a bit of a gamble, but we hope we get one in a few years now. And we have drugs, gancyclovir and lutermavir. Um, lutermavir is the new kid on the block. Um, problem is that both drugs are teratogenic, and so you can't administer them um, to pregnant women. And lutermavir is already suffering from a lot of resistance. We think we know why, but um, that's, that's another story. And then down here at the bottom, I have possible, and remember, that's a, that's a big word here, possible. It's just possible. There's lots of looks like, smells like, gee, just maybe sorts of data that suggests that cytomegalovirus might play a role in atherosclerosis, cancer, and immune senescence. But in no case do we know for sure that it plays a role, but those are things that we really need to um, keep our eye on. So um, the story that I'm going to tell you is about HSAT2. Yeah, okay. HSAT2, um, which is a non-coding RNA. It's a, um, well, the repeat is a pericentromeric satellite repeat. Um, it's transcribed to make RNA. Um, the repeats are tandem, tandemly repeated variants of 23 to 26 base pair consensus sequences. And the repeats are transcribed to produce CPG-rich RNAs, CPG-rich RNAs. So um, one of the things that I know attracted the attention of, of um, Ben and Arnie was um, um, David Ting pointed out that um, this RNA was something on the order of a hundredfold overexpressed um, in multiple epithelial tumors and cell lines derived from those tumors. Um, subsequently, um, they reported that it's reverse transcribed to, to generate RNA-DNA hybrids that can reintegrate um, at HSAT2 loci, expanding these loci then um, in tumor cells. And knockdown of HSAT2 RNA slowed tumor spear growth, and it also, it also slowed um, the growth of tumor cells in a variety of other different assays.
Um, ben and Arnie went on to show that HSAT2 RNAs induce inflammatory cytokines, a, a series of them, in transfected dendritic cells, and they showed that this induction was mighty 88 dependent, um, arguing the toll-like receptors are very likely um, involved in that induction. And that induction is probably due to the fact that these RNAs are CPG rich. Okay, so that's HSAT2. So um, here's the paper that we published earlier this year, a tumor-specific endogenous repetitive element, so that's HSAT2, um, is induced by herpes viruses. And um, you see Ben um, is the senior author here. Um, David Ting um, provided um, a very critical piece of data to the paper that I'll show you. Um, Macha Nagalski is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab that I think it's fair to say did a lion's share of the work um, in this paper. And here's Arnold J. Levine. And Arnie is the person that told all these other people, uh, you guys should get together and start to think about this because I think there's something interesting here. And you know, I think you were right, Arnie. I think this is interesting. So um, the first thing that Macha did was to ask, well, um, okay, um, HSAT2 RNA um, is um, much more abundant in tumor cells than in normal cells. What happens when we infect a normal cell with cytomegalovirus? Well, it turns out it's induced. And here you see the fold induction of HSAT2 RNA. This is a lab strain of cytomegalovirus, and here's two clinical isolates of cytomegalovirus. Um, they're all inducing a um, hundredfold or a bit more, and remember the number for the various epithelial tumor cell lines was about a hundredfold. Um, and so that's in fibroblasts. We also see an induction in epithelial cells. And we also see that herpes simplex virus um, is able to induce HSAT2 to an even much greater extent than cytomegalovirus does. Um, but here, um, here's my old friend adenovirus. It doesn't do anything, okay? We don't see any induction of HSAT2 with adenovirus. And the same is true for RNA viruses, influenza, Zika, hepatitis C. None of them could induce um, HSAT2 RNA. So, okay, we can um, see an induction in cultured cells in the laboratory. Um, at one level, that's a pretty artificial system to look at this. Um, what happens in the real world? And so um, um, David Ting and his colleagues were able to show that HSAT2 is induced um, in HCMV colitis. And so here you see um, normal colon epithelium, and then we have colitis, which is low-grade HCMV, and the low-grade is judged by the fact um, that if you stain for HCMV IE2 protein, um, you can certainly see the staining, but it's nowhere near as intense, the brown here, um, that you see in a high-grade HCMV colitis. And then if you do the um, in situ hybridization, which is pink here, um, you can see um, in situ hybridization to HSAT2 in the low grade colitis sample and much, much more hybridization in the high grade. And so it's not just a cell culture um, artifact, it's something that really happens in human disease, i.e. HSAT2 RNA um, is induced. Um, one of the interesting things about the induction is that the profile, i.e., um, the expression of, um, of RNA from sequences on different chromosomes is quite similar, um, with one exception, chromosome 7. It's quite similar um, in infected cells as it is in cancer cells, okay? So um, the infection seems to be mimicking what's going on um, in the tumor cells, and that's true for both cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex virus, the two um, herpes viruses that induce it. Um, one of the things um, that Macha was able to do was to devise a set of um, HSAT2 RNA-specific probes um, so that he could look at the HSAT2 um, made on chromosome 10 and chromosome 16, um, and um, then he followed um, the accumulation of HSAT2 as a function of time after infection. And um, you can see that um, the accumulation peaked at 24 hours. One of the intriguing things about this, to my mind, is that the accumulation happens quite slowly over a long period of time. 
Um, it's not something that seems to just turn on and rapidly accumulate, but it's a slow accumulation over time. And um, we were also able to determine um, which are the viral genes that are responsible for this induction. And if you're going to make a guess, um, um, your first guess would be the cytomegalovirus immediate early one and immediate early two proteins um, that are responsible for this. And um, we were guessing for a gene that is expressed early um, because we knew um, that if we blocked the expression of late viral genes, it had no effect on the accumulation of HSAT2 RNA. And the IE1 and IE2 proteins are very potent and very promiscuous transcriptional activating proteins that work through a whole series of different mechanisms um, to activate transcription. And so, sure enough, um, if you took IE1 and IE2, um, here, um, the, the, I guess this is in orange, the orange lines are showing you um, ARPE19 cells um, where we've induced the expression of IE1 and IE2 and you induce then the accumulation of HSAT2 in them. Um, you induce the accumulation to a somewhat lesser extent um, in fibroblasts. And if you um, add just one of the two um, um, viral gene products, um, you, you get little to no accumulation. Okay, so IE1 and IE2 are resp primarily responsible for the induction. It's interesting, um, we now know that um, there's a third viral gene called PUL97 that increases activation in both cell types by an additional factor of about three. And UL97 is interesting because um, it phosphorylates and um, inactivates the RB protein. Okay, so um, that might well have something to do then with the induction of HSAT2 RNA. So um, one of the um, really critical um, experiments that, that, that Machu was able to do um, was to um, develop the ability to very effectively knock down um, HSAT2 RNA, prevent its accumulation after infection. You see that it's um, reduced um, by more than 99% here um, using um, locked nucleic acids um, to, to do it. So then he could go and look and see what's happening um, to the virus during infection um, if he doesn't allow expression accumulation of HSAT2. And the first thing that he noted was that knockdown reduces HCMV yield by a factor of 10 to 100. So tenfold in fibroblasts, 100-fold in epithelial cells, and um, so far we don't know why those two cells are different, but they're really quite different, and it's something that we're interested in. Um, he also sees a global reduction um, in the steady state levels of every viral RNA that we've looked at. Okay, so all of the RNAs are reduced by about 70%. So they're 30% still being expressed. And um, we, we um, are interested, I'll tell you one idea for how they're being um, reduced in just a moment. And um, we also see um, dramatically reduced infected cell movement. Okay, and we think that movement of infected cells is extremely important um, for spread of the virus um, in vivo because clinical isolates of the virus stay very cell associated and they move around to different locations, we think, inside of the infected cells. And so HSAT2 might be playing a very important role in that movement. So um, we haven't yet begun to worry about um, exactly um, how HSAT2 um, supports replication, but um, we have a hypothesis for what might be going on. And actually, Rudy Yanish introduced this um, um, very um, beautifully just a few minutes ago. So it turns out that HSAT2 RNA is reported to bind um, to MCG um, binding protein 2, um, MECP binding protein 2. And, um, and you heard um, from Rudy that this protein can form nuclear condensates. Um, one paper that attracted our attention um, was that this um, binding protein um, 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 this binding protein 2 um, can bind, I didn't, I didn't type this out correctly, but this binding protein 2 can, can bind to HSAT2 RNA in the nucleus and form aggregates, as they called them, of the protein. 
And maybe this has something to do um, with the nuclear condensates that Rudy was talking about. But you know, we noticed that the infectious unit to particle ratio um, was quite reduced for HCMV grown um, following HSAT2 knockdown. So maybe there's something wrong with the viral um, DNA and maybe what's happening is that that DNA is somehow becoming methylated and um, the MECP2 protein is binding to it and inhibiting the expression of the viral genome. Turns out that there are um, 14 CPGs um, in the promoter region of, of the um, cytomegalovirus immediate early promoter and, um, and MECP2 has been reported to silence the major immediate early promoter over a long period of time in transgenic mice. So maybe that's what's going on. And, and now after hearing Rudy's talk, I'm, I'm much more enthusiastic about going and spending some time on this. So um, since the paper came out, um, Mach has continued to work on this. And um, he finds that HSAT2 RNA um, is not only induced by infection, and it's not only induced in tumor cells, but it's also induced by DNA damage. And um, there's a long literature that shows that HCMV, like many viruses, um, induces ATM activity, which of course is indicative of, of a DNA damage response. And HCMV infection or zeosin treatment um, induces HSAT2 accumulation, and you can see that here. And so again, we've infected with H HCMV, and you see in the orange here um, the high level of HSAT2 RNA, um, the fold increase in HSAT2 RNA. And interestingly, in HCMV infected cells, um, two markers that you might want to use um, for DNA damage aren't induced. Okay, here's the scale for that. And um, that's P21, so that's of course a, a P53 induced protein and DINO, which is a link RNA, which is also P53 induced. And there's a good reason why they're not induced um, in CMV infected cells, because CMV goes after P53 and inactivates it. Okay, so that all makes sense. Here's zeosin treatment. Um, we get the same induction of HSAT2, and um, we get um, our markers to come up now um, for the DNA damage response. Um, HSAT2 is also induced by autoposide, um, but not by single-stranded DNA breaks, not by um, UV treatment. Okay, um, here's some more data for induction by zeosin. Um, you can see that we get a nice dose response um, of HSAT2 coming up um, after um, 48 hours when we treat with zeosin. And again, if you look at um, the kinetics of accumulation, um, it's a slow accumulation, just like in, in infection. It's, it's not fast. And so um, all of our experiments um, with zeosin were done at, at 200 micrograms per mil. So uh, we think we're under conditions where we're not toxic, we're not affecting cell viability, but we're very clearly, slowly um, inducing the accumulation of HSAT2. So um, the last thing I'd like to tell you about um, in terms of new data um, is HSAT2 RNA accumulation requires ATM, okay? So um, the cytomegalovirus IE1 and IE2 proteins um, have long been known to induce ATM. And it's also long been known that a block to ATM, you can knock it down or use a drug, um, reduces the yield of the virus, okay? Um, and of course, ATM um, I'm going to show you here is required for induction of HSAT2 by HCMV or zeosin. And um, here are siRNA experiments um, where we knock down ATM and we reduce the induction of, of HSAT2. Um, ATR had no effect and um, DNA um, PK um, SC had no effect. And so that was true for cytomegalovirus and true for zeosin. Okay. So we know then that um, ATM activity is required to induce um, HSAT2 in infected cells. And interestingly, um, if we knock down targets, the ones we've done so far are CHECK1, CHECK2, and P53, targets of ATM, none of them influence the accumulation of, of HSAT2. And that's where uh, Matcha is focused right now. Um, what exactly is the pathway
um, downstream of ATM that's leading to the accumulation of HSAT2 RNA. So what do we know about HSAT2 at this point? So um, we know um, from David Ting's work that it's expressed in many tumor cells and at least in some cases has been shown um, to support efficient tumor cell growth. Um, we know that HCMV infection induces HSAT2 RNA, RNA accumulation via IE1 and IE2. Um, we know that IE1 and IE2 accumulate ATM, um, which is clearly required. Um, they activate ATM, which is clearly required for HSAT2 RNA accumulation. Um, we know that DNA damaging agents, double-stranded DNA damage, activate ATM and HSAT2 RNA accumulation. And um, we know that um, HSAT2 RNA knockdown reduces the accumulation of all viral transcripts assayed, and that's most of them, okay, because we were looking at RNA-seq data. And um, we know that HSAT2 RNA knockdown reduces the production of progeny virus and also reduces the infectivity of the particles that are made. And finally, um, HSAT2 RNA knockdown reduces migration of HCMV infected cells as well as um, the migration of tumor cells. Okay, that's been shown by others. Okay, so that's what we know. Um, what do we think are the interesting questions right now? Well, obviously, um, we think it will be really interesting to understand the mechanism by which ATM induces HSAT2 RNA accumulation. Um, we'd also like to know how um, HSAT2 RNA uh, uh, supports efficient HCMV RNA replication, and this comes back to wondering whether um, an MECP2 sponge is playing a role here. Um, we'd also like to know if HSAT2 RNA um, might play a critical role um, in HCMV latency. So I've been showing you data for um, cells where when cytomegalovirus infects them, fibroblasts or epithelial cells, it replicates productively and makes progeny. Um, but remember, if you infect CD34 positive bone marrow cells, um, the virus um, is unable to actively replicate and produce progeny. In fact, we, we noticed some years ago that what happens is that initially the virus expresses all of its RNAs and everything seems to be going well, but then over the course of several days it shuts down and only a very small number of viral RNAs continue to be expressed. And so we're very curious whether HSAT2 RNA expression um, might be induced by HCMV in CD34 positive cells. And um, maybe it's not. And um, that, that could tell us something kind of interesting. Okay, and then finally, does HCMV infection increase HSAT2 RNA um, in glioblastoma tumors? I'll tell you why I'm interested in glioblastoma tumors in just a moment. Um, but um, um, MECP2 overexpression um, has been reported to inhibit glioma cell uh, proliferation. And so if um, HCMV downregulated um, MECP2 expression by upregulating HSAT2, um, maybe that would be influencing the behavior of these cells. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to tell you about HSAT2. I, and I wanted to end by spending a few minutes um, reflecting on the fact that I, I began my talk today about HSAT2 um, by pointing out that it's um, something that was first described um, in tumor cells and um, something that might well influence um, the behavior of tumor cells. And you notice that I ended um, by coming back to tumor cells again. And um, folks who work on cytomegalovirus are always um, seem to end their papers by saying, and you know, um, tumor cells do the same bloody thing that I've just been talking about um, that cytomegalovirus does. And so um, what is cytomegalovirus in terms of tumor biology? And so um, you all know that there are seven viruses um, that are responsible for about 15% of, of human cancer incidence. And um, you probably also know um, that's that screens routinely detect numerous viruses in, in tumor samples, 
including many that are not considered to be tumor viruses. And it's not only viruses that you find there. You find everything there. You find bacteria, yeast, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, tumors are anything but sterile um, um, tissues. You can find lots of stuff going on there. But if we think about the viruses, um, you, you wonder, are, are some or most of these viruses just neutral passengers in, tumor, in tumors or the stroma? Or are some viruses previously unappreciated tumor viruses? Or um, do some tumor-associated viruses possibly modulate um, tumor behavior? And, and where does cytomegalovirus fit into all of this? And so um, I, I um, developed um, what I'm going to call today a, a, an HCMV Oncoscore. And here's a couple of questions I'd like to go through with you. And the first question is, well, is cytomegalovirus in the right place? And I think the answer there is um, yes, it certainly is. Um, um, it's, it's now, um, I think, very well accepted that greater than 90% of glioblastoma tumors, um, GBMs, contain um, cytomegalovirus antigens in the tumor, um, but not in surrounding cells. Um, Charles Cobbs um, is the person um, who first alerted us to this and has stuck with it and I think convinced everybody. And Dwayne Mitchell came in and, and very beautifully confirmed Charles' works a, a couple of years later after Charles. Um, we also know um, that if you um, take um, PUL83 and um, make probes and look for it um, in glioblastoma tumors, you find that it's there. Okay, that's a very um, abundant and highly immunogenic cytomegalovirus proteins. And it's been shown that, that patients who receive standard of care um, plus ex vivo PUL83 RNA pulsed autologous, autog autologous dendritic cells, um, um, they receive considerable benefit from this treatment. And so here are historical controls. Um, generally, the literature says um, that GBM patients live um, 18 to 19 months. It's a horrible cancer. And here is in the folks who got the pulsed DC cells, um, they lived um, for a meeting of 41 months. Okay, so um, this says that the viral protein is present. Um, it can be targeted as treatment. Of course, it doesn't say anything about what, what the virus might be bringing to the tumor in terms of functionality. Interesting though, um, when people look um, very carefully in glioblastoma tumors, and many of them, um, the number is about one in 80 cells in the tumors um, contain viral DNA. A much higher proportion of them contain viral proteins, but about one in 80 contain viral DNA. And no one has ever isolated, in spite of lots and lots of effort, um, infectious cytomegalovirus from glioblastoma tumor tissue. But um, it's clearly there at some point in at least some of the cells. Okay, so the next question. Um, can um, HCMV transform cells in culture? And I guess the answer here is well, sort of. And this brings up a, a very tortured um, episode in, in the herpes virus field. And um, these are transformation assays which led to people, people to the hypothesis um, that herpes viruses um, transform cells through a hit and run mechanism. And so in the 1970s, Fred Rapp and his colleagues reported that HCMV transforms human and rodent cells, but the viral genome was very rapidly lost from the transformed cells. So that was back in 1976. And then in the 1980s, Denise Galloway and Jim McDougall, two really serious um, investigators and their colleagues, reported that HCMV DNA fragments um, transform rodent cells, but the viral DNA isn't retained. Um, the trouble with this is when you look at the viral DNAs that they found that could do this, they don't map to anything that you can make sense of. And so we have this idea about their, out there, uh, um, hit and run assays. Um, it's not well accepted. I think it's very controversial. Um, and well, um, just maybe um, the virus can transform cells. Um, does the virus have transforming functions? Yes. Oncomodulatory potential, a resounding yes. And so um, if you start to think about potential transforming functions, 
The HCMV IE1 protein binds and antagonizes P53. That's why P21 isn't induced in the experiment that I showed you earlier. But you know, um, at one level, that's not all that impressive because many non-tumor viruses take influenza, attack and inhibit the activity of P53 because no virus wants P53 to go and, and um, induce um, cell death before they've finished their job of replicating. Um, HCMV has two proteins, one of which degrades and the other which phosphorylates and inactivates the retinoblastoma protein. HCMV inhibits the tuberous sclerosis protein complex, it induces CMYK, and the list goes on and on and on, okay? The HCMV PSU28 protein, um, this is a constitutively active um, viral G-protein coupled receptor, um, accelerates the growth of GBM orthotopic xenografts, and it does it very dramatically, okay? So it looks like US28, um, which has been studied very exhaustively and shown to induce all sorts of, of growth and, and, um, and pro-life programs in, in, in infected cells. Um, it can modulate the behavior of those GBM cells in those assays. And um, we've shown that HCMV induces a Warburg-like response, induces uh, a, a, a mesenchymal to epithelial transition, and so on and so forth. So it seems then that there are lots of things that the virus does that make you suspect it could alter the behavior of a tumor cell. And then the last piece to the Anka score, um, can HCMV drugs, anti-HCMV drugs, influence um, tumor progression, glioblastoma tumor progression? And I think the answer here is a resounding possibly. And I think it's because the experiments um, haven't been done in the right way yet. And so in the first experiment, a random trial, a randomized trial of 42 GBM patients, uh, this was done in Sweden, um, who had achieved greater than 90% tumor resection, um, were treated with, Van Gal uh, with valgancyclovir or placido plus standard of care, which is radiotherapy and, and, and TMZ. And um, the primary endpoint in this study um, was reduced tumor volume at six months. And there was a trend towards a benefit, but nothing statistically significant. Um, but then another study was done in which, with no controls, um, just uh, historical controls, in which 25 patients received valcancyclovir um, plus standard of care, um, beginning within two months of surgery. And patients who um, received continuous valgancyclovir beginning within two months of surgery, um, they showed um, 56 months median survival. So that's much, much more um, that you would expect of the, the 18 to 19 months from historical controls. So um, these experiments tell me that, um, hey, we should do a serious clinical trial and know what the answer is here. And that, to the best of my knowledge, that's not being done yet. And you could also wonder though, um, is va Van Gaal cyclovir um, exhibiting anti-tumor activity because it's inhibiting cytomegalovirus or does it just inhibit the tumors? Because it's well known that in a cell that doesn't have the virus um, whose PUL96 protein activates it, um, it is still activated at about 10% the level as in infected cells. And so it could be working um, simply to be toxic to the tumor cells. But either way, I think it's important to know um, what valgancyclovir might be doing. And so um, that brings me to the question, um, is um, cytomegalovirus a DNA tumor virus? Absolutely no unambiguous evidence for that. Is it an oncomodulatory virus? Um, I would say, and I think many people who work on cytomegalovirus would argue that that's very likely the case. And so I think in terms of cytomegalovirus disease, um, it's really important um, to think about birth defects, um, to think about um, CMV pneumonia in people who become immunosuppressed, but also to keep our eye on how it might be influencing um, tumorigenesis. And with that, um, I'd like to end. Um, this is a picture across Lake Carnegie in town. Um, that, that tower um, is the graduate school on Princeton's campus. And just on the other side of that tower is where we are today at the Institute for Advanced Study. And um, again, I'll point out that um, 
Um, Maciej Nagolski was a tremendous contributor to everything that I've told you about. And Arnie Levine is the fellow um, who told um, David Ting, Ben Greenbaum, and Tom Shank to meet him in his office because he wanted to tell us something that he thought we should get together and look at. So thank you.